We have Domino's Pizza, Abvi, Lowe's, and Walgreens Boots Alliance. What do all these companies have in common? They're dividend payers and they're very popular companies. And I'm gonna be doing a little mini analysis on each one of them to share my thoughts of what I think of them. Are they worth buying at the current price point? Do they have good futures? We're gonna take a look at each of these companies. Now we also have big news from Disney. They finally dropped the trailer of the highly anticipated series, The Book of Boba Fett. And this is one that I'm personally very excited for. So I wanna give you my little reaction to this trailer and especially what this means for Disney and the slowing growth of Disney Plus subscribers. We're gonna be talking about that a little bit in this episode as well. So we have a lot to jump into as always. If you like this type of content, you can thumbs up the video. If you don't like it, you can thumbs it down. Either way, it's your choice. But let's go ahead and start off with a portfolio update. This is my portfolio, it's real money. And what we do here is we show this money being invested into a variety of different companies and how that performs week by week and month by month. The strategy here is dividend growth. That's the basic summary of the strategy with a few caveats. I'm not a yield chaser. I don't look for just the companies paying the highest yield possible. I invest in quality companies that sometimes in some cases have lower starting yields, but I think over their lifetime, over the next 20 years, I think they'll pay substantial amounts in passive income. A couple examples are Apple and Microsoft. But I also invest in companies that are higher yielding, ones like Vici, Store Capital, Realty Income Corp. All these companies have 4% plus yields. I've also invested in FinTech and banking companies like JP Morgan, Visa, MasterCard, and T. Rowe Price. And these have all done very well. And I'm very big into consumer companies like Costco, Disney, Home Depot, and Nike. I really like these type of companies that have strong brand names. Overall, this portfolio is a dividend growth portfolio. So I'm always looking for the best deals of companies that pay at least a little bit in passive income and they have a high likelihood of growing in the future as well. Now, if we take a look at Qualtrim and the dividend tracking portion, which is available to all Patreon members, we can look at the dividend growth over time. This is my growth year over year. That is what the blue bar represents. That's my actual dividend income for each of these calendar years. You can see that it's going up steadily. The line chart here is the growth rate. So from 2018 to 2019, when I was starting with a very low number, it grew pretty rapidly because I just deposited money and it grew like three times. It was 360% growth. But then from 2019 to 2020, it went down from 360% growth to 81%, which is from 1,700 to 3,100. And then so far from 2020 to 2021, not counting November and December, we've grown 41%. So with November and December, I think we can hit maybe 50 or 60%. I still think we can keep a pretty good growth rate. But this is the way that I view it. It's kind of like looking at a company's revenue growth. I want to keep the revenue growth going as quick as possible. So last month I earned $700 in dividends and the growth rate so far is 40%, not counting November and December. And in total, I've earned $10,236 since the very beginning of this portfolio, but that number is going to increase rapidly. Now the market gains are obviously much bigger right now, 64,000. You might take that to mean that the dividends don't really matter and all that matters is the market gains. But keep in mind, these earned dividends help compound the market gains by buying more shares if you reinvest them, which I have. Every single dividend paid is reinvested back into the portfolio, which helps not only compound market gains, but also helps pay more dividends in the future. When I look at what's really caused the growth of this dividend income, there's three main factors. The first one, and by far the most important, is deposits. It's contributing more money to your portfolio. It's not gonna compound magically if you don't put any effort in and aren't constantly contributing to your portfolio. Every paycheck, every time you get some money, throw some of that into the portfolio. Get the ball rolling, get things going. That's really the first thing that helps compound the portfolio. Rather than buying frivolous things like new flashy cars or Gucci sweaters, I put my money right back into the portfolio whenever I get it. This is the biggest reason it's grown so quickly. But you also have a couple other factors. My companies increase the amount of dividends they pay year over year. On average, they're doing that like 10% plus. That's a lot of growth in and of itself. And then in addition to that, you have reinvestment. All the dividends that they pay every single month gets reinvested back into the portfolio. These three aspects of contributions, raises, and reinvestment is really what's pushed up this income as quick as it has. So as of right now, I'm very happy with where this portfolio is at, 
and I think that it will continue to do well. Now let's go ahead and jump into the mini analysis of these four companies. The first one is going to be Domino's and we're using Qualtrum Insights, which if you haven't used this tool, you can try it out. There's a link in the description below. It's included as part of the Patreon. Now, before we jump into the fundamentals, there's one thing I want to mention. So far, Domino's has been a compounding king. This company has trounced the S&P 500. I mean, it's really destroyed the S&P 500 over its total life. In fact, Domino's is almost one of these hidden outperformers. It's outperformed a lot of leading tech companies, a lot of hyper growth companies. It's outperformed most companies in the market by a long shot. And that comes as a surprise because it's really just a pizza joint. Another little side note on Domino's is that the investor Bill Ackman has Domino's as one of his concentrated positions. He runs a very concentrated portfolio and his smallest position is Domino's, which is actually 8.8%. So even though it's a small position in comparison to the rest of his portfolio, it's actually a very large position. Another thing to note is that Domino's is the only company that he purchased last quarter. He reduced his holdings in other companies, which means that as of last quarter, he still thinks Domino's is very good value. I think what's really made Domino's succeed so well is probably the management. They've just made aggressively good decisions. They invested so heavily into technology. They're not afraid to try out new innovative things. They really have state-of-the-art technology mixed into a pizza company, and they've used technology to leverage this business to the extreme. Outside of the technology, another thing that I really appreciate from Domino's leadership is their ability to be humble and learn from their customers. Customers were not giving Domino's Pizza good reviews a few years back. They said that it seemed like it was lacking. The crust seemed stale. It tasted like cardboard. It had no flavor. And they actually read the reviews and admitted that it wasn't good. There comes a time when you know you've got to make a change. This was around 2009 when Domino's said, hey, yeah, we've listened to your feedback. We realize our pizza sucks and we're going to change that. And they did. They redid the recipe. They redid the formula. They implemented quality control protocols. They did taste tests. They listened to customer feedback. They really improved their product. They put a lot of effort into it. So I think Domino's represents one of the biggest underdog stories in the market. This pizza joint that really leveraged technology, customer feedback, product improvement, and innovation to grow its company substantially and grow profits for shareholders substantially over the past decade. And the results show the market cap is 17 billion. The Ford PE is 32. That's a lot that you're paying for a pizza joint. People obviously see the qualities in this company and now they're trying to pay up for it. We have the price to sales of four and the enterprise value to EBITDA of 26. So overall, just on these simplified valuation metrics, this is a relatively expensive company in terms of pricing. People are pricing this at a high multiple. What we have to determine is if that multiple is worth it. Well, we can look at a couple metrics to try to get some idea of why people are paying such a high multiple for this company. We can look at the top line revenue growth. Domino's has it. They have revenue growth. You can clearly see this growing over time. They also have EBITDA growth, and you can see a clear trend in their EBITDA growth. We have free cash flow growth over time. This looks good as well. We have net income growth as well. And with all of these, you can start to see why investors are paying up. The company's improving most of its fundamentals. At the same time, if we look at the balance sheet, their last quarterly reported debt was $5 billion. So that is quite a bit of debt considering that they only have 300 million in cash. That's a lot of debt, 5 billion in long-term debt for 300 million in cash. But again, looking at the free cash flow, it shows that they're still able to support those debt payments just fine. They're still generating free cash flow even after the debt obligations. And the dividend history is extremely consistent ever since 2013. Before then, it's kind of, you know, they miss a few years. They have some special payments. But after 2013, it's really when they got on track and they started growing it consistently every single year. Now, the earnings per share growth of Domino's is really on a, a level of its own. If you were to look at this EPS growth and you didn't know what company it was attached to, would your first thought be a pizza joint like Domino's? That wouldn't be mine. I'd be like, this has got to be some type of uh, some type of tech company, like Adobe or something. Earnings per share growth this rapid usually doesn't come from different food joints. But here you see it. Domino's is growing their earnings like crazy. And then, of course, the last thing we can do is see if the company is diluting shareholders or actually increasing your equity by doing share buybacks. Domino's not only pays an increasing dividend that's increasing rapidly on average 20% year over year, but they're also doing buybacks at the same time. So they're increasing your equity and growing your dividend at the same time that they're growing earnings. 
This is like the trifecta for a company. And their share buybacks are no joke. These are very aggressive share buybacks. They went from 47.9 million to 46 million. Then the next quarter in 2017, they went from 46 million shares outstanding to 42.8. They bought back like 3 million shares in one quarter. And it looks like as of more recent, they're doing those share buybacks again. 38.7 million shares outstanding to 37.59. Every quarter they're buying back like a million shares, give or take. That is really aggressive share buybacks. So all of a sudden, looking at all the factors here and the fundamentals and the future growth of this company, it starts to make more sense why people are paying a 32 PE ratio for Domino's. I think it's well justified. I really think that that's probably the PE ratio it should be trading at. Now, I don't own Domino's in my portfolio. I own Texas Roadhouse, but Domino's is one that I'm very seriously considering. Pizza is something that people love. That's a product that's never gonna go out of style. As long as they can make good pizza, people will continue to buy it. And not everyone loves it, that's fine. There's lots of other pizza joints. Domino's doesn't have some type of unique monopoly, but what they have is a huge network. They have name brand recognition, and they have a lot of technology that they're leveraging to stay ahead of the competition. So as of right now, I don't see Domino's as any particular still, but it's one that I don't think is such a bad deal. I think this is a company that you could dollar cost average into. Next up, we have AbbVie, which is one of these dividend investor favorite companies. It's a big pharmaceutical company. They sell Humira as one of their primary drugs. It's gonna be going generic in a few years, but they'll still retain a lot of the profits that they have from that, even though generics will be made. AbbVie is a stock that dividend investors really like for a couple reasons. One is that the dividend yield is 4.46%. It's a very high yield and a very low yield market. The payout ratio is also pretty low, 42%. So they pay a very high yield with a safe payout ratio. The PE ratio is also incredibly low, making this a value stock. A lot of dividend investors consider it to be undervalued at this price. And if we compare it to any other pharmaceutical company, it really does look undervalued. We can type in Pfizer here. Pfizer has an 11 PE ratio, higher than Avvies. Merck has a 13 PE ratio, higher than Pfizer's and Avvies. And J&J, &J, probably the highest quality pharmaceutical company in the world, has a 15.6 PE ratio. It's about double what AbbVie's is. So if we compare AbbVie's valuation, even to the industry itself, it still looks really cheap. But I want to explain why. I think there's a couple reasons why AbbVie trades at a lower valuation than its pairs. Like I mentioned, one big hurdle that AbbVie faces is concentration. Morningstar says that in the quarter, AbbVie posted solid results across its portfolio with the exception of International Humera. It's down 17%, where biosimilars have launched. Now, I'm not super positive what biosimilars are, but I think it means generics. A another form of the same drug in the international market has launched, causing AbbVie to lose some of that revenue because now there's competition. They no longer have exclusivity to this drug. They go on to say, we expect total Humera sales, almost half of total sales, so they have a large concentration in Humera, will decline even faster starting in 2023 with staggered biosimilar entries from six or more firms, some with interchangeability designations. I'm not really positive what that means. We expect annual U.S. Humera declines close to 40% starting in 2023. This is something that investors are pricing in. So all of a sudden, the low PE ratio, the 8 PE ratio, while J&J &J has a 15, starts to make more sense. A big revenue source for AbbVie is going to be on the decline starting in 2023, and investors are simply pricing that in. Now, on top of the issue of being concentrated into Humira, we have a couple other things to look at with Abby. The revenue growth has been good. We have a company that's growing their top line revenue. The EBITDA looks good. That's growing over time as well. Abby generates a lot of free cash flow. Their net income looks good. It's profitable and growing over time, year over year. But then we get into their debt. This company carries $74 billion plus in debt. $74 billion. That is a lot of debt. And if we contrast that with their cash balance, they actually have a lot of cash. They're sitting with $12.25 billion of cash, which is a lot. So even though they're carrying a lot of debt, this is more than enough cash to get them by, I think, any tough time. Now, the AbbVie team has also been remarkable at growing their earnings. This is very good earnings growth. But keep in mind, this is all historical. As investors, we want to look at the historical data and the fundamentals so far, but we have to look to the future. They have the Humera issue coming up right around the corner in 2023, which will be a big headwind for this company. 
it'll be tough to continue growing this EPS when that happens. Now, after we look at the EPS, you might notice that both the debt and the shares outstanding seem to go up quite a bit around the same time, right? The debt goes up early 2019 and it goes up even further in 2020. And then right at the beginning of 2020, or actually halfway through 2020, the shares outstanding go up pretty high. Seems like they were raising debt, they're raising capital in both the debt markets and in the equity markets. And I think this is of course to buy Allergan. So you can see the shares outstanding go up over time, but this is money I think used very wisely by the AbbVie management team. They raised some capital and bought a really good company, which is Allergan. So after looking at all of this data, I think that AbbVie is a very good company. It's a well-ran pharmaceutical company. It's probably trading at a lower valuation. It's a safer play than most other companies. But keep in mind that this is not the perfect story. They have high amounts of debt, they have a concentrated portfolio, they have major headwinds in 2023 with Humira, and the company has difficult growth paths. They constantly have to be buying other companies to grow their portfolio. So pharmaceutical companies in general, I think are very difficult. And AbbVie's not quite as undervalued as I think most dividend growth investors believe it is. Now, next up, we have another dividend growth investor favorite, which is Lowe's. And obviously, I'm going to be comparing this one with Home Depot. So we'll be doing some cross comparisons here. I already own Home Depot, but I have considered swapping it for Lowe's because I think that there actually might be better value in Lowe's, despite both of them being great companies. Lowe's has a $162 billion market cap. By comparison, Home Depot's is almost twice as much, $389 billion. So Home Depot is much bigger by market cap. Lowe's has a PE ratio of 19.8. Home Depot's is 24.6. So investors are paying a premium of Home Depot over Lowe's. And then we have the other important metric, the price to sales of 1.7 for Lowe's compared to Home Depot's 2.7. So right there, we can compare and contrast and see that investors are paying a pretty good premium for Home Depot. They're paying a much higher price to earnings and price to sales for Home Depot. Now, the interesting thing is, is that even though Lowe's is priced at a much lower multiple, the company's actually growing a little bit faster than Home Depot. Home Depot is known to be one of the best dividend growing companies in the market. But take a look at Lowe's dividend. This is growing pretty rapidly. Look at this last dividend increase. That's a pretty big step in one year. Here's what Home Depot's looks like. Theirs is going up rapidly as well. So both of these companies have very strong dividend growth. Now Lowe's earnings per share growth has been very good. It's been spiking up the past couple of quarters and you can see a strong trend upwards. Now part of their earnings per share growth is the result of their constant share buybacks and they've accelerated their buyback policy since the end of 2020. So looking over these fundamentals, I see a very strong company. This has everything going in the right direction. Their earnings are going up, their shares outstanding are going down, their debt's very moderate, the dividend growth is insanely fast. The company has a very low payout ratio. They're well capitalized. They have a decent cash balance. They have a huge network effect. Lowe's is not going to get disrupted by any other competitor. And I think overall, the company is in a very strong position. One thing I also think is worth mentioning is that Bill Ackman also has a whopping 18% of his portfolio in Lowe's. It's his biggest holding and that's quite a bit to concentrate into one company. He's obviously seen a lot of value in Lowe's, but another thing that you want to look at is what he's recently done. And as of last quarter, he's actually reduced his Lowe's holding by 15%. So he's not buying in right now. He's owned Lowe's for a while and he's currently reducing his stake. Now, like I've mentioned before, I own a little Home Depot and I don't have any Lowe's. So this is one that I'm actually interested in looking at. And I'm constantly doing valuation comparisons. When I look at the valuation discrepancy between Home Depot and between Lowe's, I actually think that Lowe's is the better deal right now. If I was to buy into these companies new and I was picking which one to buy between Home Depot and Lowe's, I'd probably pick Lowe's. I actually think it's the better deal. And I have considered swapping my Home Depot shares for Lowe's, but right now I don't think the discrepancy is big enough to justify such a trade. So as of right now, even though I think that Lowe's is marginally a better deal than Home Depot, I don't plan on locking in the gains and incurring taxes just to switch to Lowe's. If the discrepancy widens and Lowe's does become even more undervalued compared to Home Depot, I may make that trade in the future. Now, next up, we have another favorite of dividend investors and value investors alike. And this is one that I think I'm going to disappoint some people because I don't see the vision here with Walgreens Boot Alliance. A lot of people are invested in this company. A lot of people really like it. And when I look at it and I study it, I just don't see what the, what the vision is here. Let's go ahead and look at a couple things here. It's at a P ratio of 9.6. So it's trading at a cheap valuation. The trailing PE is 16.7. So they must have had a pretty good quarter and grew their earnings quite a bit. 
the price to sales is 0.3. So this is a value stock. It's trading at a cheap valuation. It also pays a dividend of almost 4% and the payout ratio is 37%. So it has a well covered dividend. Now, if we look at the revenue, so they're growing their top line revenue at a pretty moderate to slow pace. The EBITDA looks flat over time. We can ignore the COVID dip and just kind of write that off. But overall, without that one portion, it looks pretty flat. We also have the free cash flow. It looks pretty flat, even declining a little bit over time. The net income also doesn't look too impressive. It's pretty flat. We can subtract out COVID here and pretend that didn't happen. And even then, it hasn't really recovered and surpassed where it was before. It's still kind of in the same area. Now they have a decent amount of debt. It's nothing to be really too concerned about. $9 billion with $1 billion of cash. That's not too bad. And their dividend is very good. They're growing their dividend over time, but you can see the growth start to slow down over the past couple of years. And I think that they're not gonna be able to support really fast dividend growth. You're not gonna see the same thing that you saw with Lowe's or Home Depot with Walgreens. They really don't have the money to do that. Now the next graph that we look at is the one that's really concerning to me. It doesn't paint a good picture in my mind. This is the earnings per share growth. We like to see companies increasing their earnings over time. That's important. That's what you wanna see. Peter Lynch said it very simply when he said a company that grows its earnings will likely have the stock price go up. A company that has its earnings decline will likely have the stock price go down. It's really just that simple. Now they are doing share buybacks. They seem to have slowed that down a little bit more recently, probably because they're doing some acquisitions. I think on the bright side of Walgreens is that the management does seem driven to grow this company and make it more profitable in the future. Walgreens recently announced a $5.2 billion investment in Village MD bringing its stake up to 63% from 30. So this partnership and investment with Walgreens and Village MD, it may be profitable in the future. But as for myself, I'm not gonna be buying Walgreens stock. I wish you investors well that are in this stock. I think it's trading at a reasonable valuation. I don't think the company is gonna get crushed or anything like that's gonna happen. But I also don't think that Walgreens has any significant moat. And they have a lot of well-capitalized competitors like Amazon that are moving aggressively into the healthcare industry and the medicine industry. So I see this as a little bit more of a, a challenge for Walgreen than meets the eye. They have a lot of big obstacles to overcome to put this company back on the right path. And I think that the pricing is appropriate. I think the company should be trading around a 10 PE ratio. If it was trading at the same rate as other companies that are growing much faster and have much more clean earnings growth, I don't think it would make much sense. So I'd rather pay up and buy the streamlined business of Domino's than the cheaper Walgreens that I think will have more struggles in the future. I may be wrong. I hope that I'm wrong and that this company does well, but that's my thoughts on it. Okay, now moving on from those stocks, I wanna mention Disney here. I haven't done an update in a while and this company has really struggled this year. I'm in the green by $3,300. That's a little bit of gains, nothing spectacular. And the company has really had a tough time this year. It's actually in the red. Their stock is in the red this year while the rest of the market is going up like crazy. So what's happening with Disney? Well, the primary driver of Disney's stock price right now is Disney+. Plus. If you're trying to do research or analysis and trying to determine the future value of what investors will look at Disney and value it as a company, this is gonna be the primary driver. This is gonna be the thing that drives the stock price upwards or flat or downwards over the next five years. I'm very confident of that. I think that if Disney Plus is successful, Disney will be successful. If Disney Plus is not able to continue its growth, then Disney stock will not grow. The challenge that Disney's facing right now is one of slowing growth, a slowdown in that subscriber growth. They've already given out their own internal projections of how many subscribers they'll have. They're projecting they'll have 230 million to 260 million subscribers by 2024. So that's the goal that Disney has set for themselves. But what we're seeing is a slowdown. They went from 103 to 116, and they're saying that this quarter is gonna be even slower than the last. Where does that leave us? This is the whole growth story of Disney and it's already slowing down. If the subscriber growth slows down to a crawl where it's only a few million a quarter, they're definitely not gonna be hitting their own internal projections. So the real question investors are asking themselves and analysts are asking is, are they going to be able to hit these subscriber numbers? Will they really meet these goals? Now, I think I know the problem with Disney Plus's service. They have a couple high quality series come out, but they come out very infrequently. We have series like WandaVision, and we'll take a break and we'll have Falcon and the Winter Soldier. 
and then we'll have Loki. And these are great series and there's only a handful of them. But I really think the Mandalorian series was not only the best original on Disney+, Plus, but I think it was the key series. It was instrumental in setting this service apart from other streaming services. While this is running, people are happy about Disney+, Plus, and many people only kept the service for this series. It drew in a lot of subscribers, and a lot of subscribers are churning. They're leaving after The Mandalorian. Well, as The Mandalorian is on break, we have the trailer for the Boba Fett series. And as I predicted with The Mandalorian, saying that I thought that series was going to be an enormous hit just based off the trailer, just based off the filming, I'm going to say the same thing about this series. I think that this will be an enormous hit for Disney. So let's go ahead and watch some of it and see if you agree. I am not a bounty hunter. I've heard otherwise. I know that you sit on the throne of your former employer. Jabba ruled with fear. I intend to rule with respect. You were all once captains under Jabba the Hutt. I'm here to make a proposal that's mutually beneficial. Why speak of conflict when cooperation can make us all rich? What prevents us all from killing you? Taking what we want. If you had spoken such insolence to Java, he'd have fed you to his menagerie. Please, speak freely. This series is going to be a hit for Disney Plus, and I think that's a pretty easy prediction to make. I don't think that's a really bold prediction. So where does that leave us? First of all, I'm not concerned about the future prospects of Disney as much as these analysts are. They're concerned about slowing subscriber growth. So what if there's a slowdown for a couple quarters? Disney has a multi-year plan to build out a huge Star Wars universe with many series and spawned off series in different directions. The same thing with the Marvel universe. These are all things people wanna watch. And when these new series comes out, the subscriber gains will continue. My prediction is the end of this year when the Boba Fett series comes out, It'll have renewed excitement about the Disney Plus service, and I think that Q1 of 2022 will see a pickup in the subscriber gains. So as of right now, even though the analysts don't agree, my thoughts on the long-term prospects of Disney Plus and their subscriber gains are still very much intact. I still think this company's headed in a good direction, even though the stock price is not trending that way. I think that a lot of investors are wrong, and they'll change their minds later this year. Now that's all for this episode. I hope you all enjoy your Friday and your weekend, and I'll see you in the next one.